Hi, I'm Micah Woods. Welcome to Cart Rides with Micah. I'm here with a special tournament edition and professor, professor edition with Dr. Frank Rossi. Frank, should we go look at some grass and have a cart ride? Can't wait to do it. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> Let's do it. Frank, it is so yeah. good to see you again, <laughs> man. So good to see you. Is that Kale Bigelow? Thanks for joining me on this cart ride, Frank. <laughs> you I thought we were riding in a cart. I, I watched your video. There's guys in a cart. I don't get sometimes a cart. Sometimes there's a cart. I don't no, get a sometimes cart. Sometimes there's not a cart. <laughs> sometimes we walk. Okay. Yeah. But watch. then you shouldn't call it cart rides with Micah. You yeah. should call it walking with Micah. Walking with Micah. Well, we might walk on some surfaces. But now we're just standing with Micah. We might walk on some surfaces and we might scuff them up or mm. and then how would we measure that mm -hmm. a lot of people are using the usga's gs3 ball for smoothness and trueness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i like to use the bobble test mm -hmm. and other people use the perimeter mm -hmm. and then you told me do we even need to measure this and i said yeah i think so and i think the bobble test is the way to go mm -hmm. what do you think is the way to go we have been trying to figure this out for a really long time uh the where the energy that isn't put in the ball moving forward, where does it go? Sideways or up and down? And if that energy is lost, I always thought it would be reflected in speed, in, in, in the distance. It didn't seem to be the case where we could do it on a, a sort of what I would call a bumpy surface um, and that speeds wouldn't be demonstrably different. In fact, our golf shoe data for the last seven years shows really clearly that even when we wore metal spikes and, 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 and ball roll was disrupted, it was rarely at a speed that a golfer could detect in that six to eight inch range, at least as the benchmark we use for that. We couldn't even get that much of a change in green speeds. So that's how I started asking about smoothness and trueness. We started with Sphero that Scott McElroy came around with then, then we went to the perimeter. We paid attention to Scott, Sean Askew's work with uh, the strike plate and the deflection and dealing with the legacy effect, which I thought was really good. And now the GS3 is on the market. And at the same time, you know, Doug Lindy did a bunch of these things. And of course, you have been an advocate of the bottle test. I don't care. I don't know what to do with that information. I know when we have green speed stuff, we have had a series of practices and maintenance we know what to do. I don't know exactly what the I'm, data is showing me that I need to do. I'm, or I'm worse yet, worse yet, <clears throat> if we're if we're doing it to explain thing to golf explain things to golfers, and I talk to my golfers that work with me all the time. When you're in your putting stance and you're making a calculus for how you're gonna hit it, what we assume is in their head is the line uh, and the speed, right? Because that's what we've taught them. If we are now going to say it's a X on a GS3, how do they put that into their calculus? Well, I like the bobble test. But how do I put that? Okay, it bobbles. It's a five. What do I do? Do I hit my putt different? Do I'm I gonna go change to my golf mower? Course. I'm going to might complain in the pro shop, and I might go to another golf course the next time. Because if it's a five on the bobble test, the, I saw the ball bounce. The putting greens were bad quality. But did you so, miss a putt? I'm, I'm. Isn't more the idea to make a putt, no, not to care how it gets to the hole? But it's people care about how it gets to the hole because you can see guys on the PGA Tour shooting 14 under, 18 under, 24 under on the mm -hmm. West Coast swing. Mm -hmm. You also hear them complaining about the greens because the ball is not rolling as smooth and true as it tends to do I... on the East Coast. So uh, as a turf grass manager, as a golf course superintendent, I can instantly take those data. Mm -hmm. and, and I have some clients who measure these data mm -hmm. and it also correlates with the customer complaints. Okay. The customers will say that the bobble test they're measuring the bubble test goes down and the customers are saying it's getting bumpier. They what complain. did the superintendent do to bring the bobble test into alignment with lower, the golfer? Lower the mowing height. Mm. Is that always, but see, this is what I mean. When well, you at a different golf course, at a different golf course, maybe you do more rolling. Maybe you top dress. Maybe you verticut. There are a number of tools in the maintenance shop over there that can be done.
So to me, it's, it's quite simple. And I am baffled that it's not that simple to you. It's not that simple to me because I still don't know what I can tell a superintendent when a bobble test is a certain way. The only time we see bobbles that are problematic for us is, uh, is when we've done our golf shoe work and we've purposely disturbed an area. That's where I see you need to visit no golf. You need to visit golf courses that have been aerified, because that's a common maintenance practice yeah. that I would say, on average, happens to putting greens in the United States at least once a yeah, year. Yeah, but that you don't need a bobble test. People call ahead. People call ahead and say, "Do you aerify?" If they aerify. They're not going. They don't need a freaking bobble test. They know the greens are bumpy. In fact, I think when a lot of resort courses, they've got to publish when they're going to airify and they lower the rates at that time. I think you're exactly right. What I'm talking about is a run-of-the-mill state park golf course where the greens are rolling seven, eight feet or a wing foot or a hazel team where the greens are expected to roll 11 to 12 feet. I don't, I'm th wondering if we're worrying about things that number one, the golfers don't worry about, although you've just refuted that claim. I, I don't hear that. I, I don't hear yeah. that. I think- I, I think, hear slow. I think I don't wrong. hear bumpy. Let's go, let's move. Let's go on a cart ride. Okay. Okay, so it is a cart <laughs> If Carl was here, I'm sure he would take my side. Carl, <laughs> okay. You, I think you're totally When Carl wrong. and I have these conversations, when, when we have these, and Chase gets involved in these conversations as well, but certainly, and now we've got another engineer involved with it who's using machine learning to predict how the ball's going to roll with the information from the GS3. We are now extracting the, the USJ is giving us the data, access to the data, and we are looking at uh, where these uh, events are occurring and the amount of events and then we're just we found a paper that looked at friction loss of a ball moving across the surface and now we can model where the ball will then be dispersed to my contention with you is very simple um, I don't think people miss putts because of any data provided from a bobble you said it earlier. I don't, I don't care about missing putts. But that's what they're supposed to do. Our golfers, job is to provide golfers, them a playing service to put a ball in a hole. Golfers care about bumpy greens. I think they talk about bumpy greens, but I think we're measuring bumps that they can't perceive and don't need to know about to make a putt. I'll show you. Yeah. They don't need to know about it. They're, they're shooting Let's 14 like, under and they're complaining the ball's bouncing. Tough nuts. Oh. I don't care. I could have said something else, but we're here, so. I'm shocked. I'm shocked. Well, we have spent a I've actually probably been thinking about this even longer than you've been thinking Let's about this. Let's cut this guy off. <laughs> okay, you're just gonna do this. Let's go talk about this on something really bumpy, right? Well, you wanted a cart ride, Frank. How's this? <laughs> I actually can't remember the last time I sat in a school bus. Uh, it's been a while. Hey, since we kind of uh, don't completely agree on the utility of the smoothness measurement, because I think it's a tool that superintendents can use, and you think maybe it doesn't really matter to the golfers, right? I, I so feel like we, okay, all right, all right, we'll finish this up, and I'll, I'll leave my point with this. I'm not convinced we figured out how to interpret this number for either golfers or maintenance people. And that might be where we disagree. Okay. I don't believe I, we can interpret those numbers yet to tell people what to do. Be but, but the bubble test is straightforward. Above an eight is pretty good. Below eight, somebody will complain. It's, it's pretty simple. Yeah. I'm okay with that. I mean, cool. Okay. Remember a couple years ago? You were so kind as to be a guest on the ATC Double Cup podcast. I love that Double Cup podcast. Thank so you. Get you in. You really that double I, cut into it. And I love your podcast, <laughs> frankly speaking. <laughs> right. And I listen to it all the time. And every time it gets kicked off Spotify for whatever reason, it's back on. It's back on, and I'm so happy Excellent. about that. Thank we, you. We worked on that. We're that's on awesome. a new platform now. That's big good. shout out to Peter McCormick and the Turf Neck. Yeah, group. that's a great podcast. So. Uh, we talked about fertilizer, and I've recently talked with Dr. John Tem, Jock, Dr. John Dempsey about Duh. fertilizer. We were in Iceland together, and 
we kind of disagree, I think, about the usefulness of adding extra things beyond N, P, and K, maybe a little iron, mm. in terms of in enhancing turf grass quality mm. and specifically in suppressing diseases. And mm. I just think if you put the right amount of nitrogen at the right time, mm. and if you prevent nutrient deficiencies, you've already done about all you can do with nutrition. And he's saying, oh, but but there's all these programs. If you Maybe you can add this, you could add that, and it's going to reduce anthracnose beyond what you get from just manage, managing the grass well. I wondered what your take is on that. Because I think, and even some of your research would show it, that compared to uh, programs that are designed by the fertilizer companies with their best products and their best combination of products, the simple urea and maybe monoammonium phosphate and potassium sulfate mm -hmm. and ferrous sulfate mm -hmm. was equal to or better in quality mm -hmm. to almost all mm -hmm. of those over mm -hmm. a multi-year. Yeah. Yeah. So Here I come go. at it a little bit different. I come at it the other way, which is actually our work years ago. We didn't put potassium. We got less p snow mold. We put potassium. We got more snow mold on bank. That was one of the first times I had recognized, wow, something other than nitrogen was involved in some disease stuff. The next one was the acidifying nitrogen fertilizers, the summer patch work from years ago, where they said this kind of nitrogen fertilizer, uh, different than a nitrate-based and ammoniacal source of nitrogen, provides some acidification. Then there's the manganese and take-all issue. Okay? That's the list. That's the entire list I'm aware of where nutrients are anywhere near remotely involved in managing diseases. Uh, potassium, as we showed in your work, and Dave Moody then followed up and did some more on that. Um, acidifying nitrogen sources for summer patch, uh, root, root pathogens, uh, and manganese for take-all. But, but I don't know how much any of those are suppressive, like does holding potassium off suppress snow mold? Does, does acidifying fertilizers suppress the organism? Does manganese suppress? I think they're just sort of either compensating for something happening in the soil or helping the plant in like the manganese way. I would never say feed the plant a certain way with these nutrients that other than those three things, I couldn't recommend. Is that, is that fair? Or you have more thoughts about that? No, that's fair. Thank you so much, Frank. Thanks for joining me on the cart ride, Frank. Happy to do it, Micah. Always great to see you. Great to see you, too.